What is happening y'all? Cowboy here and welcome to my starter guide for Salt and Sacrifice. Now whether you played the original of Salt and Sanctuary or this is your first time jumping on into one of these games, there's definitely a lot of things that can seem uh, kind of overwhelming at first. You know, there's a lot of very familiar mechanics that you may have known from Souls games, things like dodge rolling and iframes and all that. Uh, but the leveling here is quite different compared to your typical Souls game. And with this game, the sequel, Salt and Sacrifice, we even have some elements of Monster Hunter with the mage hunts and whatnot. So either way, we're gonna be talking about a bunch of different stuff in this video, the UI, leveling, uh, looking at, at weight and rolls and combat, how to parry, talking about the various mage hunts, going through the PVP options. So either way, let's jump on in and talk about Salt and Sacrifice. And the very first thing I wanna mention is going to be the UI. Uh, just starting from the top left, you can see I have a red bar, that's going to be my health, and there is a blue portion that's currently next to it. That blue portion is the same as being in like a hollowed type state. Uh, and to get out of that, we need to use what are known as guiltless shards. You can find these throughout the world. You can get them as drops from uh, summoned minions as you're fighting mages. So they're not particularly rare, I think, in the course of playing so far. I'm around 20 hours and I've probably collected, God, I don't know, 30 or 40 of these things. Um, so if you want to get rid of that blue portion of your health bar, you're going to need to pop the Guiltless Shard, and then you'll see your health will go back up to red. In addition, if you want to do uh, like PvP or co-op, if you're trying to summon somebody into your world, you need to be in a Guiltless state, which is what I'm in now, where I have the full health bar. If you have that little portion of the health bar missing, you're still able to do co-op or invade uh, as the secondary party, but you're not able to host those activities. So keep in mind, uh, it's similar to having humanity active uh, to be able to open yourself up to multiplayer, similar to how Souls games work. The green bar, of course, is going to be my stamina. Uh, this is going to be used as I block, as I roll, as I attack, you know, any real actions in the game. Even casting is going to use up stamina, using ranged weapons will use up stamina, etc. Now, speaking of ranged weapons in particular, uh, over in the far left, we have two different weapons. Over on the far right, we have our ranged weapon. You can see the ranged weapon with my controller, it's LB, and then I would hit X to use that. And that's depending on whether you have a, a channeling rod or a bow or throwing axe or whatever the case is. Over on the left are my main melee weapons that I have equipped. Now with your melee weapons, we have different bars depending on the type. With a casting oriented one, you can see I have a blue bar, that's focus. And with a melee oriented one, I have a red bar and that's rage. Now focus is pretty straightforward. Focus, you know, you start with full focus. As you cast, that bar goes down. To refill it, you would need to use a haste decoction, which will bring that bar back on up. Uh, so it's considered a limited resource. The red bar is considered rage, and rage is going to build up as long as you are in combat. Uh, in particular, just combat in general, if you're hitting, so you need to be doing damage. But even doing range damage, you can see that that bar is still going to build on up. So rage you build up via fighting, and then you can spend it, you know, going ahead and hitting down the left trigger in my case and pressing X. I can now see I've enchanted this rapier with ice, and I can now do extra bonus ice damage on top of the normal damage. You can see a damage over time effect getting applied there. Uh, whereas of course with just regular casting, that's just gonna you know, eliminate your resource as you use your spells. Moving on from there, we have any of our equipped items. Uh, some of these things like the hearth and flask or the haze decoction, they will auto refill, assuming you have the necessary materials. For example, these little red trees, every time you loot one of these and you get those valley herbs, when you rest at a obelisk, those valley herbs will go back in and refill hearth and flasks. So as you're going throughout the world, anytime you see mining deposits or trees or vines, always make sure to pick that stuff up because you don't just get your flasks for free. Uh, similar to how you would in, say, Dark Souls. It's closer to Bloodborne in the sense that we need to have a material for those flasks, and you get that from the various things you interact with out in the world. Uh, on a similar note, as for our ranged attacks, these, we need to make sure that we're always hitting these mining deposits and getting that right there, the Irona Ore. Irona Ore is used to replenish your ranged, uh, your ranged item uses, whatever the case is, your ammunition, uh, so always keep your eyes out for that as well. Uh, now, the last thing I want to point out is the bottom left of the screen. We have two different numbers there. The 190 indicating my silver. That's my currency for buying or selling items. And then the 10,544 is my salt. And that is considered my experience. The bar beneath it is full because I currently have enough experience to level up. So let's go on over and we'll talk about that. Going over here, if I level up, you can see that in general, every time I level up, my health is going to increase very slightly. And you'll see I'm getting access to 
black star stone, and in some cases, a gray star stone. But leveling up isn't going to stop there. All leveling up is going to do is give you those stones, and it's going to spend your experience. So we can see that bar has emptied on out. And if I need to, at this point, I need to go into the tree of skill and actually spend those star stones. Now, this is probably the most intimidating part of this game, in my opinion. The first time you look at the skill tree, you're like, what is going on? There's stuff all over. Uh, but there are a couple of things that you can look out for. Namely, that weapons are actually kind of laid out. If you look at it kind of zoomed out, you can see this symbol that I'm circling around right now. It looks very similar to a scythe. And sure enough, this is where the Reaper weapons are located. Over here, this one right above me, this kind of looks like a helmet. Sure enough, this is heavy armor. Over here, this has a hammer type look, and of course, it's a great hammer. So when you're looking through your tree, you're gonna kind of have a, a, a vague look at stuff, like right over here, oh, this kind of looks staffish. Sure enough, yeah, that's where the staves are gonna be. Uh, now, actually using your points, after we level up, we get access to those stones, and that stones are how we're going to navigate in the tree. Anything that is purple is something we can currently pick up. I could pick up Strength and Resolve right here. I could pick up Conviction. I could pick up whatever the case is. Uh, in addition, using the Gray Stones, you can take back points that you have spent on anything that's not considered a permanent unlock. So we can see how there's, like, on the top left and the bottom right, there's, like, little notches. That means these are permanent unlocks. So I cannot refund Class 2 Stave or Class 3 Stave or Class 3 Bane Reader. Uh, but all the connecting nodes, I can refund. And what's interesting about this game is even if you refund stuff, for example, look at, uh, we'll get this, we'll refund this. Wasting one of my gray star stones wheel. Even if I refund that point of Arcana, all of this subsequent upgrades that I got, these are all still active. So it isn't like a lot of games where, you know, the tree needs to be complete. And what's nice about this is, for example, I wanted to use Reaper weapons because I found a Reaper that had good uh, Arcana scaling. It was a good, basically a Mage-style Reaper. But we can see here I needed points of Conviction, and then I get Class 1 Reaper, and then Conviction, and then Conviction, and then Class 2 Reaper. And then all the way up towards the end here, we had another point of Conviction. But despite that, you can see I already have Class 5 Reaper. And what I did is as I went through the tree, the idea would have been that I would have grabbed Conviction, Acquired class one after I had that I refunded this point then I grabbed conviction conviction acquired class two after getting class two I got rid of this point so as long as you have reached a new connecting node you can refund previous nodes and by doing this you can reach certain things and min max your build even further another good example is I'm running a, a dex heavy armor build on stream so heavy armor is going to be on over here this gives us endurance, which is equipment load, more endurance, but here's strength. As I said, I'm running dexterity, so I didn't need that. So I leveled up from here to here to here, and then I refunded the strength point because, you know, I have no reason to have that strength. So as you're playing, keep in mind where you are spending your points, and definitely don't shy away from getting those levels because, you know, it's obviously going to be very beneficial. Another thing I want to point out, uh, the... The ones that you can't refund, they're usually very high value. And what I mean is class five staves, for example, yeah, it's gonna cost three black star stones to unlock, but I'm also gonna get three points of arcana. Whereas typically one point will get me one point of arcana. So even though these cost more, you're getting huge value here because you're going to not only unlock a new tier of weapon, but you're also getting a three for three on top of it. Besides that, a couple things I wanna point out that I think are good for everyone is uh, one, the armor. Over here, we have access to the light armor. And then as I kind of already showed it earlier, over here we have access to the heavy armor. Armor is going to impact both your defense as well as your poise. And of course, heavier armor is gonna have more weight, which will impact your rolls. And we'll look at that in a second. The other thing I wanna point out are the runic arts. So over here on the left, we have divine glyphs. And over here on the right, we have forbidden glyphs. And these are super important, pretty much regardless of your build, because it's going to give you access to the special abilities that your primary weapons have. So just to, to go more in depth into what I'm talking about, if I go here into inventory, or let's go into equipment, and I look at the staff, I can see I can hit the left or right trigger, and if I tab over, Lightning Bolts, Class 2 Forbidden Glyph. Storm Strike, Class 3 Forbidden Glyph. Uh, this has a Class 1 and a Class 4. This has a 2, a 3, and a 5. This has a Class 1 Forbidden. Um, so as you are picking your weapons, keep in mind what they need, because if you have a weapon that actually needs to have access to those Forbidden Glyphs or those, uh, those Divine Glyphs to use their special ability, if you don't have that unlocked, 
you won't have access to that ability. And those abilities are super cool. I mean, even with melee stuff, you have stuff where you're gonna, you know, sheath your entire blade and fire and then do damage over time that'll build up with every attack. So definitely do not pass up on these, depending on your weapons, because they are gonna be useful. Uh, moving on from leveling though, as I mentioned, there is equipment load and a bunch of other things. So next we're gonna talk about stats. Stats are actually pretty straightforward in this game. Uh, going over, we have Strength, Dex, Vit, Will, Endurance, Arcana, Conviction, Resolve, and Luck. Now, a couple of these are pretty straightforward. Vitality, every point of Vitality is going to increase our health. Every point of Will is going to increase our Stamina. Every point of Endurance is going to increase our total carry weight. And every point of Resolve is going to increase our focus. Beyond that, all of our other stats here are going to be scaling. So Strength, Dexterity, Arcana, Conviction, and Luck are all going to be scaling stats. And you can see that looking at your weapons. This is going to have Arcana scaling of E. This gets E and Dex and D in Arcana. This is E Strength, E Dex, C in Arcana. Uh, this one is gonna be E over in Dex. This is gonna be Strength in Arcana. So keep in mind the scaling on your weapons as you are picking up those stats because that's gonna be what impacts how much damage you're gonna be able to do with them. Uh, besides that, Luck also has the added benefit of increasing your item find. So after you fleshed out your whole build, if you're looking for item find, luck is of course a, a decent stat to go to. But let's talk about equipment weight in particular, because similar to Dark Souls, we have four separate rolling thresholds in this game. Uh, in particular, we will take off all of our armor, and you'll notice right next to carry, there is a little icon that's currently orange. And as I remove pieces of gear, you can see it slowly goes down to green. Now green is gonna be what we consider to be a ultralight. This is the fastest roll. It's gonna have the most iframes goes very, very quickly, as you can see. As we start to add on armor, we will then go up to yellow. Yellow is still considered a light roll. You're still gonna go very fast and very far with this. Going on up more, we get to orange, which is considered a medium roll, and you know, very similar to souls. You can see we still got a decent roll here. It doesn't have, it's not the fastest with the most iframes, but it's functional. And then when we go even beyond that, we go up to gray which this is gonna be our heavy roll. You can see we're quite slow here. On top of that, you know, we're, we're not going very far, but of course we have some heavier armor and defense. Uh, going beyond this, eventually you'll get to over encumbered, which is where your total equipped goes past your limited carry weight. Now I also want you to notice that uh, the carry weight is purely dependent on your armor here. So having two weapons on, having a ranged weapon, rings, amulets, none of that is gonna impact your carry weight at all. So when you are considering your encumbrance, the only thing you need to consider is how heavy is the armor that you have on. Um, moving on from there, let's talk, actually I didn't touch on money, so I'm gonna touch on that real fast. I mentioned obviously spending salt, uh, but our money is gonna be for working with merchants. As you can see here, the guard's Spagenhelm would cost 500 and I only have 190, so I can't pick that up. Now this game functions very similar to Sekiro in the sense that when you die, you're going to drop all of your salt. All of your experience will be dropped and you will permanently lose a small percentage of the silver that you're carrying. To help offset this, we have a mechanic very similar to Sekiro in the addition of the silver bags. So the idea here is I can pay 1200 silver to get a bag that holds a thousand silver. And at first thought you're like, well, why would I pay 1200 for a thousand? And it's because that thousand silver is gonna be safe. So I do this all game long. As you can see, I currently have 20 large bags of silver. And this means that on demand, I can get 20,000 silver anytime I need it in increments of 1,000. And that silver is not at risk of being lost if I die. So that is the benefit of the bags. As you start to make lots of money in the game, I'd highly suggest utilizing it just because that way it's, you know, it's like depositing it. It's like having it safely in a bank and you're not gonna lose it even if you die. Uh, as for the experience, of course, you're not going to permanently lose experience unless you die twice, but that is something to keep in mind. Uh, and while we're on the note of this guy, let's talk briefly about some NPCs. A lot of these guys you're going to unlock just as you play the game, but I'm going to touch on a couple of the key ones. This one, of course, is going to be the main merchant. Uh, he doesn't sell anything particularly crazy, but he does have the salt bags. So those are nice to pick up. Up there, as I already showed, is where you're going to be leveling up. Right here in the middle of town, we have some training dummies. Right over here, this is going to be the guy that we talked to about artifacts. In particular, artifacts are these things. It's it's uh, just, you know, things that are going to give us boosts. We have one that's utility, one that's defense, and one that's offense. 
So using him, we can upgrade our artifacts, increasing the level of them, which basically re-rolls them to a higher level with a chance at better affixes. Uh, we can also break down ones we're not using and combining those mats to do upgrades. Over here we have the blacksmith who you don't actually interact with. You use the table right here to craft equipment. Crafting equipment is going to use any of the materials that you have found from mages. And then of course over here we can enhance our equipment which will use upgrade materials to increase the tier of that item. Uh, with armor it's going to increase the defense even further. With weapons it's going to increase their damage even further. In some cases increase the scaling. Beyond that going on down. Uh, right here. This is the lady that's going to take care of your hunter tools. Anytime you find something cool, like in this place, is that steel glass ore. That's the main ingredient for Frostvein decoration. Now I have access to Frostvein decorations. So as you find stuff, always make sure to come back by her. And we can also go over here to upgrade our hunting tools. So this will upgrade the total amount of ammunition you have. Haze decoctions, hearth and flasks, uh, you know, any of these decoctions. As you find these rare things throughout the world, this is where you upgrade how many you carry. And these are going to also replenish. So as long as I have like the Irona ore, I'm going to get uh, more ammunition when I rest. As long as I have access to those little red things I showed you at the start, I'm going to get more of these when I rest. As long as I have access to the, the hay stuff, I'm going to get access to decoctions when I rest. So all that stuff is going to be replenished. Oh, please. <laughs> uh, going on over here. Uh, going below this is the Treacherous Grotto. That's where like a lot of your, the, the quote, bad guy PvP factions are. Um, so that's going to be locked until you find one of them, but they're all going to be down there. So I'm not going to bother showing all that, but I will talk about that in a bit. Uh, the last thing I want to point out here is, of course, going to be the Rune Reader. Every time you talk to the Rune Reader, they're going to be the one who tells you, you know, oh, hey, you've unlocked this area. Uh, you also want to talk to them as you pick up Faded Mage pages and whatnot. And so let's talk about, about the room reader and how this works in particular. So first up, we have our zones. Now there's a couple of different zones you can go to. You're gonna unlock these just through progressing throughout the game. Beyond that, we have named mage hunts. Anytime you discover a named mage, if you don't kill it then, it'll be in this list here. Named mages are one of the primary points of progression in a zone uh, because you're gonna need to kill certain named mages in a zone to unlock doors in that zone, which will then lead you to you know, PvP people, rare items, armor, all kinds of stuff. Moving on from there, we have Nameless. Now, Nameless Mages can be accessed after you have killed their named version, and then you find their, uh, you know, their associated summoning item out in the world. And these are basically just more powerful versions of the mage you just fought, but they give you access to not only the loot of that mage, but the mask. So in this case, I have the Mask of Fury. This is the mask the Pyromancer wears. If we were to compare this to the Red Metal Helm, it's just better. It has like the same weight, the same poise, but just better stats across the board. So if you find a particular armor set that you like, chances are that the nameless version of that mage is going to have a helm that's just like best in slot for you. Moving on from here, uh, these are going to be our daily hunts. Now we get these from fighting Fated Tomes. You can find a Fated Tome in each zone. As you take that Faded Tome and you bring that over to the Rune Reader, you're going to unlock these. And these allow you to just hunt a specific mage. Now, obviously, I can go out at any time and hunt a mage in a zone. You know, I can, right now, for example, I can go to Ashbourne Village, go over to where the Pyromancer typically spawns and chase them all over the map. However, doing the daily version of these, this is going to track mages very similar to how it tracks during name mage hunts or nameless hunts. So as they run around the map, you're going to see the trail that they leave behind. So even though it is daily, these are going to rotate in, and it just gives you an easier way to go after certain mages and track them down. And in some cases, they're more powerful than the version you fought. For example, a tier 15 Necromancer, that's pretty beefy. Tier 5 Pyromancer, I mean, the initial one's like a tier 1 or tier 2. Uh, moving on from there, though, let's talk about the Covenants. So from this room gate, we have access to our, our friendly or our good guy Covenants. And down in the Treacherous Grotto, which we'll show you in a second, we have access to the Invader-type Covenants. Now, in particular, we have six different Covenants in this game. Uh, besides the Covenants, we also have just normal PvP, which you don't need to worry about invasions at all. This is just using a passkey to play with a friend. If you just want to play with somebody and you don't want to deal with invasions or, or worry about Covenant rewards or anything else, and you strictly want to play together, you can do that here. However, let's say you want to do something involving the Sun Bros, or the sheriffs, or the oathbound, and you want to do this stuff to get those dope covenant rewards, you're going to need to be doing normal online play. So Dawnlight Cooperation, this is, it's the Sunbro Covenant. 
Uh, doing this is going to join a world and help a host that has opened himself up for co-op. Uh, in particular, to do that, you have a couple different items here. Is it at uh, the pale candle? Using this, that is going to allow you to do the same thing as what we just looked at. Uh, if you're a host over here, you would pop the golden candle, and that is going to basically say, "Hey, I'm looking for somebody who can co-op with." Similarly, the bronze snuffer is going to put that candle out. That means, "Hey, I don't want to find anybody anymore." Now. Every single covenant has an item, but that item can also be used. It's basically identical to the gate. So the idea here is the pale candle, search of a golden candle light, initiates the search for an inquisitor seeking aid. Using the candle is going to be different from using Dawnlight Cooperation in the sense that the candle is allowing me to pick a particular zone. So for example, if I use Dawnlight Cooperation right here, that is just going to look for anybody that needs co-op. But let's say I wanted to help somebody in Corvus's Mire in particular. I would go to Corvus's Mire and I would use my candle and it would do the same thing as selecting Dawnlight Cooperation. However, it would work only in the Corvus's Mire so I can choose where I want to help. Um, now that we've gotten that out of the way, every covenant has their own item, so you can always just do a general search or a specified search. But let's talk more about the covenants. So Dawnlight Cooperation, as I mentioned, this is the co-op covenant. You're basically the Sun Bros. Uh, when you are sun rowing with somebody, it does open them up to invasions, but of course, you both get access to some better rewards. You get stuff for killing the invader, you get stuff for completing your journey. Uh, the sheriffs will hunt the blue heart runners, which is a like PV, PVE covenant that we'll talk about a little bit later. And the oathbound intervention, this is similar to the blues or the fun police from Dark Souls. So these are going to hunt down both Shroud and Chaos. So to recap, Friendly co-op, hunting the PvE invaders, fun police who hunts down invaders all over. Now moving on over here, gotta go into the Treacherous Grotto. See if I can make the jump, I always fail at getting the jump. Yeah. And you can see we have a rune thing right here. Now over here is where we're gonna have some of our PvP stuff. Uh, this will function, I mean, functionally this is the same. You could use this same as you could the one up there. The only difference is over here for the multiplayer tabs, we have the more in invasion-centric ones. Uh, so to start, we have the Shroud Invasion. Shrouds are, they're basically your reds. You are going to invade a world, either that somebody is co-oping, uh, or alternatively, if somebody has the red candle active. You can find the Crimson Candle, Red Candle, however it's localized in your version of the game. And this will just straight open you up to invasions, whether you're doing co-op, whatever the case is. If you are doing co-op and you want more invasions, the Red Candle opens you up. There is also a cooldown for invasions. After you've been invaded, you can't be invaded for at least 15 minutes unless you're using uh, either a, a Full Moon Consumable or the Crimson Candle, which will, of course, increase the rate of those invasions. But so our first one, the Shroud, Shroud is just your invaders. Your goal is to go in and kill the host. The Blue Heart Runners is a little bit unique. The Blue Heart Runners, the idea is you invade into the world and you need to go after Hazeburn. These are the enemies that are shambling versions of typical enemies in the zone and they spawn alongside while mages are active. And your goal as a Blue Heart is to hunt down those Hazeburn and collect the, the drop from them. You also get items where you can hide in the world. And the idea is you're trying to disrupt the host's world and after doing so, you will then weaken the host and you can decide whether you want to kill him or not. But your goal is PvE focused, whereas Shroud, on the other hand, is specifically just trying to kill the host. So definitely a really fun covenant that I'm excited to play around more with. Uh, the third one, which I do not have yet because you get them quite late, is the Chaos Hunger Covenant. And that functions very similar to the Mound Makers from Dark Souls 3. The idea is you can invade any form of multiplayer, whether it's somebody that has a blue heart or a shroud or they're doing co-op or they have a sheriff, whatever the case is, it doesn't matter. Chaos Hungerers can invade any form of multiplayer. You can attack the host. You can also help the host. You can leave gifts or you can try to trick them into traps. So that is the catch-all. You do whatever you want uh, as the, the chaos. And similarly, you get rewards, whether the host kills the boss or whether you kill the host. So definitely a fun covenant and true to its name. Uh, with, with with a name like Chaos Hunger. So we'll actually just jump right out here. Uh, the next thing we're going to be talking about, I know there's a lot of content in this game to go through, right? Uh, the next thing we're going to talk about is just general hunting of mages and then combat as well. 
So combat is pretty straightforward in this game, uh, but there are a couple tricks. Uh, first thing I want to talk about is how different weapons have different combos. So for example, if I'm just hitting X, I'm going to keep swinging my blade. Uh, if I want to do an aerial combo, I could do light attack, heavy attack, heavy attack, light, light, light. Now something like the rapier, for example, I can go light, light, up light, and I'll do a bunch of quick swings. If I go, what was that? I think it's light, light, heavy, heavy, yeah. It's like light, light, heavy, heavy, light or something. So the point I'm trying to make here is not every weapon is going to have the same moveset. In some cases, there's going to be variations of hitting up or down with your stick, like I am right now. Most weapons will have a jumping attack, but all weapons are going to have your light attacks and your heavy attacks. Uh, but the actual combos of those weapons will vary. So just something to keep in mind. Experiment as you play. I know like the uh, the katanas, for example, have like an EI draw. You can do a heavy attack and then double tap light and your guy will do two follow up slashes. So there's definitely some good variety uh, to the weapon play here. Not everything is going to be the same. It's just, you know, your R1s or your R2s, how it would be in Dark Souls. Now, talking about defense in particular, obviously we have rolls, you all know that, but we also have blocks. And with blocks in particular, I wanna point out two things, damage blocked and blocking cost. Some weapons are not gonna block a ton of damage. My staff here only blocks 65% and blocking cost is minus 45, meaning I'm gonna lose significant stamina blocking with this. Something like a Vanguard, however, blocking 90% of damage and the blocking cost is minus 15, meaning this is going to block significantly more damage and it's going to cost a lot less stamina. Now, of course, I don't have class one Vanguard or class two Rapier, so it's gonna be, you know, I can't actually demonstrate that difference. Uh, but for example, this blocking cost is minus 20, minus 45, just to show off the difference between those two. Even against a basic enemy, I'm blocking here, you can see it's taking a pretty, pretty nice chunk of stamina out. If I swap over to my scythe, you can see taking those double attacks, lasted. actually, you know what, this is getting a little, I kill one of them just to, Make this more consistent. And if I compare that over to my staff. So blocking is functioning just by holding the left trigger. The same button that you're gonna hold to pull up your menu to do those specials. We also have a perfect block or a parry. The idea with that is hitting the button right exactly when you're about to get attacked. It'll open the enemy up. As you can see, I'm getting a prompt to hit B there. When you hit B, you do the dagger follow-up, critical, repost, whatever you want to call it. Um, now that is this game's form of parrying. I know a lot of people in the previous game, you know, you could you'd hold left trigger and you tap X. Well, that's now how we do either our forbidden or our divine glyphs, so we don't have that anymore. Instead, we have a perfect block so in a sense, it's very similar to Sekiro, the idea that you get those perfect blocks and eventually the enemy's posture will break and you can get a free follow-up. Now, on lesser enemies like that, it's gonna kill them outright. On beefier enemies like a boss, it's just gonna do some significant damage, but that is how parrying functions in this game. We don't, we don't have an actual um, knock aside parry where like we use a shield and we knock the enemy aside. The, the parry is the perfect block. So the last thing I wanna touch on is obviously I mentioned how we can uh, you know, hunt mages via the, the daily hunts or whatever the case may be. The daily hunts, finding the name, finding the nameless. You can even find mages just out in the world. After you've beat a couple mages for the zone, uh, if you're just going on out into the zone, I mean, this is the very first zone. If I go on over here, there's going to be a pyromancer just chilling. Now, as he runs around the map and he retreats, you can see I don't see the trail of where he went. That trail that tells me like, hey, he's going to be to your left. I, I saw him go to the left, so I know he's going to be over here. But the point I'm making here is you can freely hunt mages even if you don't have an active hunt for them. It's going to be a little bit trickier because you're going to have to kind of, you know, you'll see the general direction they went, but you're not going to have a trail that's going to lead you directly to them. You're going to need to watch very carefully where they're going and hunt them down to get that kill, which obviously is kind of why it's, it's better to do things like the the daily hunts because you're going to have that trail and it's going to be easier to track them um looking through my notes though i think that's going to cover pretty much everything i wanted to mention here rules perfect one mages covenants yes so yeah um that is it that, that is my 
overview. There's there's a lot to this game, though. Um, I think we've covered pretty much everything. Uh, just a couple random stuff. I know some people are curious. Hey, what about leveling up? Do we have to always come here? Um, from talking to the devs for the time being, yes. They, they currently have no plans to change that. So if you want to level up, you got to come back to town, go to the statue. Um, to be fair, there's a lot of shortcuts you can unlock in zones. So, you know, it's not that bad to come back to level up. Uh, another thing I want to point out, this is a, a thing I did initially at the start that I tried multiple times, uh, but punching in random rune combinations does not work. Uh, you know, we were able to do this and just punch in runes. And there's some stuff later in the game that I'm not going to spoil where that does come into effect. Uh, but if you hunt a mage, for example, I can see, you know, I can see, oh, this is the Electromancer symbols. If I try to punch in, let me see if I can actually, just, just to show what I'm talking about. If I go here and I just pick one. Oh, it's already, I'm going to have to, I don't think I can take them out. Well, anyway, I can't just punch in symbols here and like match this and go hunt that. Uh, when you want to do one of these, you're going to have to pick it and it's going to throw the symbols on down for you. You can't just manually punch in the symbols. Manual punching in will come into effect significantly later or significantly later in the game, uh, but it's for a couple things that I'll let you discover on your own. So just something to keep in mind. So I know at the start, you know, I found runes and I was like, oh, I'll just punch in these runes and rehunt the Pyromancer and it didn't work. And I was like, well, why can I even punch in the runes if it doesn't work? So wanted to put that out there. Uh, but either way, despite all of the information I gave you, there's definitely a lot to, to dig into and really appreciate in this game. And I'm having an absolute blast with it. I mean, I have two runs going on right now. I probably have a third coming up. So either way, I'm going to wrap this one up here. Hopefully all of this stuff helps set you on your journey and hopefully you all learn something. And with that being said, I'll catch you next time.